حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم All praises due to Allah alone We praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one And whomsoever Allah leaves us say None can show him guidance May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad Peace be upon him My dear viewers Welcome to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious. Today's episode is number 476 in the series of Gardens of the Pious by Imam Nawawi. May Allah have mercy on him. And it will be the second in chapter number 216 which deals with the mandate of paying alms and its virtues and whatever ahkam relating to it, insha'Allah. May Allah grant us all success. May Allah grant us a useful knowledge and enable us and guide us to practice this useful knowledge in our daily lives. Ameen. In the previous episode, we barely tackled the ayat, whether of Surah Al-Baqarah or Surah At-Tawbah, chapter number 9, concerning the mandate of paying alms or zakah. Today, inshallah, we'll begin with the hadith, the first hadith, which every Muslim, every average Muslim knows by heart, the pillars of Islam, the pillars of our religion. When Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said in the sound hadith which is narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, bunya al-islamu ala khams, shahadati an la ilaha illa Allah, wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh, wa iqam al-salati, wa ita'i al-zakati, wa hajj al-bayti, wa sawmi ramadan. This hadith, my dear viewers, is a highly authentic hadith to the extent that it is agreed upon its authenticity. Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Islam as a structure is based upon and built upon five pillars. The first is the testimony of faith to say none has a right to be worshipped but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And the second is the establishment of the prayer. The third is the payment of alms or zakah. And um, the fourth is performing hajj, the pilgrimage to the ancient house. The last and the fifth, which is fasting during the blessed month of Ramadan. A hadith, as I said, collected by Imam Bukhari and Muslim. The usage of the word bunya implies the fact that whenever a building or a structure is based on some pillars, without any of them, then the whole structure will collapse. Accordingly, anyone who accepts Islam must believe and acknowledge and furthermore, perform and offer those pillars of Islam. Some of those pillars are verbal, some of them are bodily, some of them are financial, and some of them are bodily and financial. So we have the tasdiq, which is the testimony of faith that's verbal, and to verify what you actually believe in by heart. And the bodily acts of worship, the prayers and the fasting, the financial pillar is giving alms, the payment of zakah. And the fifth, which is the hajj, implies both financial and bodily. You spend out of your money and you exert an effort in order to perform this obligation. So the financial one, the exclusive financial one, is the payment of zakah. The removal of any of these pillars leads to the fall and the collapse of this structure. 
So one who denies the mandate of any of them isn't a Muslim. Even if he is strictly practicing the remaining four. And one who is negligent of his or her duty towards any of them, we come to the first after the shahada, if he is salah, then if he is insistent on neglecting it, then he is not a Muslim as well. And then the fasting, the payment of zakat, the performance of hajj, he is in the level of rebelliousness and he is feared to be out of the fold of Islam. He is feared to be out of the fold of Islam. And we quoted the ayat of Surah At-Tawbah 34 and 35. وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّةَ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرُهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ The severe warning and the serious threat towards those who hold gold, silver, wealth, and yet they don't pay its due zakah. We spoke about that in the previous episode. So from this hadith, we understand that it is of a great importance to practice all the pillars of Islam as they are mentioned in this hadith. Obviously, in the light of the ayah which says, Allah doesn't impose any takalif, any commandments, any obligations on any person beyond their capacity. So those who don't have the means, they are exempt from the payment of zakah, rather they are eligible to receive. And this is the beauty of this mutual welfare system. You have, you give a little bit to suffice the needs of those who are in need. You're broke and you're in need, then it is the duty of the entire society to assist you and to satisfy your needs. As an individual and as a family and as a community at large. One who doesn't have the means to pay zakah, I guess, doesn't have the means to perform hajj, then he's exempt. So now the pillars of Islam for him have become, at least currently, because he doesn't have the means, shahada, fasting, and salah. Perhaps a person is also chronically ill and he cannot fast. So the pillars of the deen will be reduced to basically the bodily act of worship of the salah. And when it comes to the salah, under any circumstances, as long as the person is alive and is conscious, no one is exempt from offering the prayers. That's why the main pole of Islam is like a tent. The main pole, the middle pole of that tent is a salah. فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا has abandoned the deen. Whoever abandons it, he abandons the deen entirely. Even if he is fulfilling other duties. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها makes it simply affordable for every person to do as much as he can, but they have to be honest with themselves. And if they cannot afford to pay zakah because they're poor, don't pay zakah. You will receive fund, and you don't have to perform hajj. Uh, you're chronically ill. You're exempt from fasting, and you can instead feed one poor person per each day. You skip its fasting, and that's it. It's as simple as that. But those are the pillars of this beautiful structure of Islam. The following hadith is a lengthy hadith, and it is uh, narrated by various narrations, and we covered it in more than one occasion. But this narration is very important for us to pay close attention to and to learn some significant lessons out of this hadith. That's a sound hadith agreed upon its authenticity. You guys all remember the bad one who came to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he asked him about Islam. What is Islam? Teach me what do I have to do? And when the Messenger of Allah informed him, he said, I swear to God I'm not going to do extra nor less. Okay, That is the hadith. It revolves around this meaning in this particular narration. Hadith number 1200 and seven, and Talha ibn Ubaidillahi radiyallahu anhu qal, jaa rajulun ila rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama min ahli najdin thairu rasi nasma'u dawiyya sawtih wa la nafqahu ma yaqul hatta dana min rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
فإذا هو يسأل عن الإسلام فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خمس صلوات في اليوم والليلة قال هل علي غيرهن؟ قال لا إلا أن تطوع فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وصيام شهر رمضان قال هل علي غيره؟ قال لا إلا أن تطوع قال وذكر له رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الزكاة فقال هل علي غيرها؟ قال لا إلا أن تطوع فأدبر رجل وهو يقول والله لا أزيد على هذا ولا أنقص منه فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أفلح إن صدق متفق عليه سطالحة ابن عبيد الله may Allah be pleased with him narrated that a man from the people of Najd came to the messenger of Allah peace be upon him and uh, his hair was disheveled and uh, we could hear him shouting but we couldn't really understand what he was saying until he came so close then he was asking about Islam Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him uh, five prayers every day and night so the man said well do I have to do anything else he said no unless if you do it voluntarily you offer nawafil I mean so the messenger of Allah then added and fasting during Ramadan so the man said well do I have to fast anything else on any other days he said no unless if you want to fast voluntary fasting then the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said to him about giving alms or zakah he said well, do I have to do anything else to pay any other payment he said no unless if you do it voluntarily so the man went away saying by Allah I will do no more than this no less the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said successful indeed if he means it and if he can fulfill what he promised what do we have here we have a very interesting hadith I consider it a huge reference in introducing Islam to people whom were giving da'wah you know the levels of the deen there is the person who is not really practicing the one who misses some of the obligatory acts of worship as Allah the Almighty said فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ there are three levels some of those who are the sinners those who wrong themselves they skip some of the obligations they fall into some of the prohibitions and what is this like المُقْتَصِد المُقْتَصِد the moderate the average the person who fulfills all the obligations Sometimes he falls in what is disliked, but he's like neither a big sinner nor a devout worshiper like he does all the obligations and the recommendations. He just fulfills the five daily prayers, fasting only during Ramadan, and if he was in zakah, he pays it, he doesn't give anything extra. وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِنَّ اللَّهِ السَّابِقُ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ The foremost, those who compete with each other to achieve the highest place in paradise. You remember in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, the three categories, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ أُولَئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ فِي جَنَّاتِ النَّعِيمِ ثُلَّةٌ مِّنَ الْأَوَلِينَ وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنَ الْأَخِرِينَ the highest standard and the highest rank in paradise for السَّابِقُونَ the foremost most of whom will be from the first generation, second generation, the companions and the tabi'een. وَثُلَّةٌ مِّنَ الْآخِرِينَ And a few of whom will be from the generations to come after. The first generation were the most devout worshippers. They wouldn't just satisfy with doing what is obligatory. They would do what is obligatory. They do what is recommended as if it is obligatory. They would abstain from what is disliked as if it is... the forbidden and so on those are as sabiqu bil khayrat that is ayah number 32 of surah fatir the three categories in this hadith rasulullah sallallahu alaihi is introducing islam in brief the simplest form of islam al-muqtasid the average 
be very moderate. This bad one, his appearance says that this guy is not really a, a highly educated person. Maybe he's not educated at all. So I need to take it easy on him. He's a bad one. Look at his hair, unkept, uncombed, disheveled head. And he's shouting that even the people in Europe couldn't understand what he was talking about. But they figured that he was asking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Islam. In another narration said, Ya Muhammad, oh Muhammad. You know, only the Bedouins would call the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his bare name like that. Teach me about Islam. Tell me what Allah wants from me. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dealt with everyone according to the level of their understanding. He didn't take it personal. Okay, my brother, what you need to do is one, two, three, four. Every time he spoke about one of the pillars of Islam, whether the bodily or the financial or both bodily and financial, when he said five daily prayers, that's it. The man said, do I owe anything else? Do I have to offer any other prayers? He said, لا إلا أن تطوع. No, you don't have to, unless if you want to offer voluntary prayers. Like what? Like we spoke about for months. Night prayer, emphatic and non-emphatic sunnah, before and after the prayers, witter prayer, duha prayer, whatever. So I say, no, unless if you want to do extra. Likewise with fasting, likewise with zakah, likewise with hajj. So the man said, well, I swear to God, I will not do more nor less. I will just do as he said. Then he walked away. So the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Aflaha in Sadaq. In another narration, Aflaha in Sadaq means this guy will be successful indeed if he stick to what he said. If he were to fulfill what he promised to do. What did he promise? What did he say? What did he commit himself to do? To do what is obligatory, but without increase, no decrease. Without extra, no minus. So I will offer the five daily prayers perfectly. With full khushu'ah. It is true that he's not going to pray nawafil before or after. But his prayer, he promised to offer it perfectly and on time. Zakah, likewise. Siyam, fasting, hajj, likewise. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this narration said, He will be successful if he can fulfill what he promised to commit himself to. There is another narration in which the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, whoever likes to see one of the people of paradise, look at this man as he walked away. This guy was so sincere, was so honest, that the Prophet ﷺ figured out that he really means what he said, that this guy is going to be one of the dwellers of paradise. If you like to see a man walking on earth, who will be among the dwellers of heaven? He's one of them. All of that, all the different narrations, and uh, this is sound hadith as we said, indicate what? If you're just the muqtasid, the middle class, the average person, you're just offering the five daily prayers, you're fasting in Ramadan, but you're offering all of that perfectly. You're not doing anything extra. This is what is required from you. Well, if this is the case, Sheikh, why do you give us headache? You've been presenting this program now for almost 10 years. And ask Quda for 16 years, answering questions, teaching us about Sunan and Wafil, do's and do not do's. And then the Prophet Sallallahu taught this Bedouin, the religion, in a couple minutes. And when the man said, I will just do this, no more, no less, he said, this guy will be successful, this guy will be from among the rulers of paradise. So what is it exactly? Why are you making it complicated? No, we're not. This is for average people. We have ayat in the Quran teaching us. In Surah Al-Mutafifin, the Almighty Allah says, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ Let the competitors compete in this regard. Al-Jannah, heaven, brothers and sisters, is not one floor. No, different levels. So compete with each other to occupy the highest levels. And the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, taught us, do not settle for the ground level or the basement in heaven. Rather, whenever you ask him for heaven, ask him for the highest, the topmost part, which is 
الفردوس الأعلى The highest place in heaven Okay So aim high Secondly We have the ayah of Surah Al-Imran And the other ayah of Surah Al-Hadid Whether wasari'u Whether sabiqu There are many verses in the Quran Encouraging the believers to compete Towards a higher place And a higher rank in heaven He says as we learned before if you just say subhanallah, alhamdi, subhanallah, alazim 100 times, this is great in the morning and the evening. No one will come on the day of judgment with better deeds than you, other than a person who did like you or added extra. He made it 200, then he's better. Another made it 300, then he's better, no doubt, and so on. It will be said to the reciter of the Quran who used to recite Quran in this dunya on the day of judgment in the hereafter. Iqra. وارتقي ورتل كما كنت ترتل في الدنيا فإن منزلتك عند آخر آية كنت تقرأها واو جريت ور نوت اول لايك ور نوت اول لايك اون ذا دي اوف جادجمنت دي بروموشن ويل بي بيس اون نوت هاو ماتش ماني يو بوزست راذر هاو ماتش يو براكتست سو اي ويل بي سيد تو ذا ريسايتر جو هيد ريسايت قرآن ذا قرآن يو نو اوفر 6000 فيرسز جو هيد ريسايت So you keep reciting, 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 reciting until you achieve a certain level. You stop. This is where you ended up reciting for dunya. Okay. That will be your rank in Al-Jannah, insha'Allah. May Allah make it easy for all of us to enter paradise safely without any previous reckoning and obviously without any previous punishment. Ameen. So why do we have to do extra. I didn't say you have to. But these recommendations, each act, you know when you work in any firm, for any company, for any corporate, you work your eight hours. We need you over the weekend. Well, I'm sorry, I'm busy. Uh, this time is for my family. We'll pay you double, we'll pay you triple, we'll pay you 10 times more. A lot of people will uh, pick up the offer. Why? A lot of people, in the flight, they say, we need a volunteer to get off the plane and we'll give him a ticket for the next flight in a couple hours and we'll give him a thousand dollars. It can go up to ten thousand dollars and a hotel room. Some people say, why not? I don't have any other commitment. I can just take the next flight. So people like to get the bonus, the extra. Likewise, when it comes to the voluntary acts of worship, provides us with dual benefits. Number one, it acts as complementary to what is obligatory in case you missed, you forgot, you were absent-minded, you were lacking khushu'ah, you didn't know on time, you didn't do it perfectly. So Allah the Almighty will order the angels to search in your account, in your record, and get from your saving of the voluntary acts of worship, whether for the prayers, Charity, fasting, or hajj, and come, complement the mandatory acts of worship. So it's perfect and extra, and that will promote you. This is the first benefit. To make up any deficiency, any shortcoming that has taken place in your offering the mandatory acts of worship. The typical example to that is how much we lose concentration in the prayer. While we all know that, the Almighty Allah will not accept from the prayer except what you are paying khushu' to it in the prayer. The second benefit is according to the sacred hadith, the Almighty Allah says, My servant can never do anything better than fulfilling what I ordain upon him to bring him closer to me. That is the mandatory acts of worship. Then he follows that by saying, and then my servant will continue to draw closer and nearer to me through offering what is recommended, the voluntary acts of worship. Until what? Until I love him. And if I love him, I become his hearing, his eyesight, his hands, his feet. I'll become everything for him. So obviously, the area of competition in what is voluntary, the nawafil, I mean, is optional. But it is very useful and it is to enhance your performance 
and to bring you closer and closer to Allah until you achieve the level of his love. Not that you just love him, but rather now he loves you. And you become all entirely his. Then congratulations, you passed. You're successful in both lives, in this life and in the hereafter. When he came to the level of zakah, we said, he spoke to him about the zakah, and he said, anything else? He said, illa an tatawwa. The word sadaqah, generally in the Quran or in the Sunnah, refers to the mandatory zakah. But also sadaqah covers the voluntary sadaqah, but to distinguish it, we say sadaqatu tatawwa. The voluntary sadaqah. But the word zakah and sadaqah are synonymous. So sadaqah in general refers to the mandatory zakah. That's why we call it sadaqatul fitr. It's zakah. And what distinguishes from the voluntary one, we say sadaqatu at the voluntary sadaqah. Is there any duty upon us beside the zakah when it comes to wealth? Well, the term zakah was referred in to in the Quran in Surah Al Ma'arij. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ فِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ مَعْلُومٌ لِلسَّائِلِ وَالْمَحْرُومِ Those whom they have certain rights assigned wealth, in their wealth, that is the right of السَّائِل, the bagel, and المحروم, the one who is deprived, the poor, يعني. So that is the right in his wealth, and he recognizes that. While Sadaqatu Tatawa is mentioned in Surah Al Dariyat, Ayah number 19, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admires the people who will be, uh, insha'Allah, in gardens of paradise, He says among their traits, Wafi amwalihim haqqul lissa'iri wal mahroom. And in their wealth, there is a right for a sail and al mahroom. So there is, or there are some other rights besides a zakah, the mandatory zakah. That will be discussed, insha'Allah, furthermore in depth and more details after we take a short break. We'll be back, insha'Allah, in a few minutes. Please stay tuned. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Our phone numbers are code 002 then 0238551. Alternatively, are code 002 then 0100546932322. Two WhatsApp numbers are code 001 3478 and finally, area code 001-361-489-1503. The last couple numbers are only for WhatsApp calls, no messages. I see tens of thousands of messages. I cannot afford to reply to them. We can only answer the phone calls during the program. I would appreciate that. On the page, my page, M. Salah Official, I do my best to answer even with audio messages, uh, the personal questions uh, inbox for each uh, questioner. But for the phones, I cannot, I cannot definitely afford to answer those questions. So don't feel bad if no one replies to your uh, messages on any of these phone numbers. First is a landline, second is a cell phone number, third and fourth uh, WhatsApp numbers for calls only. Uh, we have Inspector uh, Mohanad is asking if I'm leading the prayer at home, we are seven in number. So after the end of the prayer, would I turn around and face the uh, Ma'mumin, the followers, or that is only done in the mosque? No, the Sunnah is to turn around and face the Ma'mumin, the followers, whether you lead them in the masjid or at home. That's the Sunnah. Okay. So we were talking about illa an in the case of a zakah and we said there are rights in one's wealth besides the mandatory zakah. 
because the mandatory zakah is a very low amount, very small percentage. So instead of saying Rabb al or whatever, we say 2.5%. 2.5%. So if you have 100,000, 100,000, all what you pay is uh, 2,500, which is not much compared to the amount of 100,000. No taxes as small as that. And this is not tax. This is something you pay it with pleasure because you will get it in return multiple times. And this is Allah's promise. Some of the scholars listed the hukuk besides a zakah in one's wealth as the haq, the right of the poor for uh, if, if, if you're a farmer, uh, if you grow uh, whatever in the field on the day of the harvest because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-An'am Ayah number 141 So when you harvest the fruits, when you harvest the grains, when you harvest whatever poor people are around and the workers they have some right in it besides a zakah no, that's something different. So you feed the people. You give them the poor people. We know that the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ يَغْرِسُ غَرْسًا If a believer happened to plant any plant, so anything that benefits out of it, whether a human being that takes a fruit or some grapes or some fig or an animal, they grab something to eat, or insects or birds, but he will be rewarded for that. Even if you didn't intend it. You don't know who told him he didn't. You will be rewarded for that, for feeding them. The second is the right in the cattle, horses, camels, and sheep, and goat. We know certain numbers, you have to give that much zakah. No, we're not talking about the zakah. We're talking about the area. We're talking about the maniha. Manihatul Anz, for innocence, to give, you have like a, a, a sheep, a little goat, that is, uh, the other is full of milk. So you will lend it to your neighbors who are poor. Give it to them so that they milk it for a few days. They benefit out of that milk. That's called a maniha. And uh, there's something besides the zakah. Okay? And then there is the haq, the right of the guest, because that is in your wealth, whether, whether buying food or fruits or giving accommodations, that cost, doesn't it? So you don't do this out of the zakah, but you do it out of your own wealth beside the zakah, because that is the right of the daif or the guest. The Prophet said, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir, fal yukrim daifah. Let whoever believe in Allah and the last day, let him honor his guest. And the right of the guest, especially the traveler, three days. So that will cost food and accommodation. And there is something called Haqqul Ma'oon. You know that there is a chapter in the Quran, 107, it's called Surat Al Ma'oon. 107. Al Ma'oon. What is Al Ma'oon? Allah criticized and condemned certain people for their ill doing. Yura'una wa yamna'oon al Ma'oon. Whenever they do any good, they do it to show off. And meanwhile, they even prevent any assistance. What is Al Ma'oon? You know, when the neighbors come and say, you know, this is very common in, 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 the, in, in the Muslim societies. Somebody's coming to visit us, he's proposing to our daughter. We don't have the china, we don't have the silver set, we don't have the spoons, we don't have enough glasses. Would you please give us use for an hour or two? Of course, with pleasure. That's called Ma'oon, Ahariya. You give them, you assist them. It will not be decreased. They will borrow it for some time. But there are some people who do not assist no one. You're driving in somebody, so, so somebody is having a flat tire. You pull over, not because she's a pretty girl, wearing tight clothes, but because he's an old man, or he's a, 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 a father with his kids, a, a mother driving with the baby. So you pull over and say, Lady, you stay in the car, turn on the condition, we'll take care of it. We'll change the tire for you, we'll fix it for you. That is ma'oon, assistance. Okay, that is haq. 
And Allah will appreciate that. Forget about people. Whether they say thank you or they don't, you're not waiting for that. إِنَّمَا نُطَعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا We do whatever we do for Allah's sake. We're not even anticipating a word of appreciation or any sort of compensation. Here is my business card. You can call my husband. You can come to my company. No, no, no. I don't want any of that. I'm doing it for the sake of Allah exclusively. And likewise, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu says, كُنَّا نَعُدُّ الْمَاعُونَ عَلَىٰ أَهْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم عَارِيَةَ الدَّلْوِ وَالْقِدْرِ we consider Al-Ma'un as I referred to earlier. At the time of the Prophet وسلم, is to lend the pot, the utensil, the qadr, the bucket, whatever people are in need to fulfill their need. And it's simple, uh, simply alone. They're taking it for a while and they will bring it back. That is the very interesting hadith of Talha ibn Ubaidillah about the Najdi man with the shovel hair coming to ask about what is Islam in brief. The following hadith is a very famous hadith as well. Sound hadith. When the Prophet وسلم, sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen. We all know the hadith. But we're going to benefit something extra today inshallah. Hadith number 1208. 1208. An ibn Abbas بَعَثَ مُعَاذًا إِلَى الْيَمَنِ فَقَالْ أُدْعُهُمْ إِلَى شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكَ فَأَعْلِمُهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى إِفْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَةٍ فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكَ فَأَعْلِمُهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ افْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُؤْخَذُ مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ وَتُرَدُّ عَلَى فُقَرَائِهِمْ when the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal, may Allah be pleased with him, to Yemen, he said to him, call people to testify to the oneness of Allah. And Muhammad is a Messenger of Allah. And if they accept that, then tell them that Allah has enjoined upon them five daily prayers and if they accept that then tell them that Allah has enjoined upon them zakah to be paid from the wealth from the wealthy ones and to be given to their poor well according to the pronoun their their poor the Muslim Jews say that it should be given, the zakah should be given and distributed among the local poor people. The local poor people. So in Yemen, we collect the zakah from the rich and provide for those who are in need in Yemen. This is a priority. There is also another set of the scholars and they said that the term, the pronoun, hum, fuqara'ihim, refers to Muslims in general. You guys are all aware of ayah number 60 of Surah uh, At-Tawbah, which mentions the eight categories of those who are eligible for the payment of zakah. After this call, inshallah, assalamu alaikum. Tanzil from India, assalamu alaikum, Tanzil. Wa alaikum assalam, Sheikh. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, Akhi Barakallahu Feeb, Zakallahu Khairan. Go ahead. Sheikh, actually, I have two questions. Yeah, go ahead. The, my first question is, uh, can we call someone Salafi or not? Okay. And my second question is, how can we be a student of knowledge? Okay. Um, okay, uh, may I ask you why would you want to call somebody this name? As some of the people there who are calling that we are Salafi, you are not a Salafi. Okay. As some of the people are there who are calling Salafi bad. Tayyip. Barakallahu feek, Tanzil. In brief, the term 
when you add the ya of an nasab to any word, that means this person is ascribed to the previous name. Like when you say you're from India, so you say Hindi, Hindi in Arabic, he's from India, Pakistani. The word Salaf in Arabic refers to the predecessors of the Muslim Ummah, the companions, the followers of the companions, and the following generation, yani the best of the generation of the Muslim Ummah. So a person who's following their footsteps and certainly following their guidance and acting upon what they used to practice because they were the most rightly guided after the Prophet وسلم, well, this is something good. Somebody else doesn't know such names. Somebody else like this Bedouin who just practices what is mandatory and he doesn't even pray the sunnah. But he's an honest man. He's a trustworthy man. He doesn't do the haram. Most welcome. May Allah bless you. Am I better than the Prophet ﷺ when he said to this man, he would be from among the people of paradise? If somebody doesn't say, I am Salafi, he doesn't enter in, he's not entering paradise? Ah, well, according to the Quran, the name Muslim is sufficient. But also actions speak louder than words. Somebody is following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, so he's called sunnah, it's with pleasure. If you think I'm following the sunnah, but somebody is admiring himself, I am Salafi, and you're not, then Allah says, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى Never, ever be judgmental of others. As long as others are offering what is mandatory and abstaining from haram. You never know who is better than you. Never perceive yourself better than others. Okay? How to become a seeker of knowledge? Remember what Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, used to say? He used to say, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمْ You want to become a seeker of knowledge? You know, some people, they read in books. Is reading books enough to make you talibu ilm or a seeker of knowledge? No. As a matter of fact, it is kind of dangerous. I remember Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, saying, May man kana shaykhuhu kitabu, ghalaba khata'uhu sawaba. If your shaykh, if your tutor is the book only, you read and you study on your own without actually having a real shaykh and a real tutor, then your mistakes will overcome your correct understanding. And if this is the understanding, then the practice accordingly will follow the understanding. You gotta be careful. So there are English, Arabic, Urdu, Filipino, many other languages, academies, online, enroll in any of them. I definitely believe in the systemic study, not in reading books. Reading books is for leisure, for fun, just to add to your knowledge. But the basic understanding should be understood through a systematic study such as enrolling in a regular school, Jamiatul Islamiyah in Pakistan, in India, in Medina, in Al-Azhar University, in Kairawan, in any school, official school, where you learn. You learn the principles of Aqeedah, of Fiqh, of Tafsir, of Hadith. Okay, you don't read on your own. You can end up misunderstanding. It becomes really problematic. Many of those who know Arabic, there is a beautiful academy by Sheikh Salih Al-Munajjid. May Allah uh, preserve him. May Allah have mercy on him and protect him. It's called Zad Academy. Beautiful. But this is only in, in, um, in Arabic. In English, there is the online Islamic University by Dr. Bilal Phillips. There is Mishka, who is Dr. Salah Al-Sawi, is the president of this university. Some schools are absolutely for free, and some you have to pay some tuitions. So this is a way to seek knowledge. There are some also private institutes where you can learn online, distant learning. All of that is great. I was talking about a number 60 of Surah at tawbah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا والعاملين عليها والمؤلفة قلوبهم وفي الرقاب والغارمين وفي سبيل الله وابن السبيل 
فريضة من الله والله عليم حكيم. Those brothers are eight categories of recipients of zakah. And inna in Arabic is a tool which is used to refer to exclusively. So exclusively as sadaqat, the mandatory zakah should be paid to the following categories. Those are Muslims. So they understood that as zakah to be paid to the poor Muslims. So the mandatory zakah is to be paid exclusively to the poor, to the needy, to the workers of the Muslims. The voluntary zakah will may pay out of it to non-Muslims. But that is the meaning of تُؤْخَذُ مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ وَتُرَدُّ فِي فُقَرَائِهِمْ To be collected from the rich and to be paid back to the poor, to the poor, يعني to the Muslim poor people. We ran out of time and insha'Allah will continue next time. Until then I leave you all in the care of Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted to be the best and give his best religion to them so why did they ignore that forgetting all about him in paradise worshiping cows fire and stones selling the best with the cheapest price so Allah,